Chapter Nineteen of Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Nineteen Deacon Israel's Successor. It was a very small meeting at Miranda, began Rebecca, and the missionary and his wife are lovely people, and they are coming here to stay all night and tomorrow with you. I hope you won't mind. Coming here, exclaimed Miranda, letting her knitting fall in her lap, and taking her spectacles off, as she always did in moments of extreme excitement. Did they invite themselves? No, Rebecca answered. I had to invite them for you. "'but I thought you'd like to have such interesting company. "'It was this way. "'Stop your explaining and tell me first when they'll be here. "'Right away?' "'No, not for two hours, about half-past five. "'Then you can explain, if you can, "'who gave you any authority to invite a passel of strangers "'to stop here overnight, "'when you know we ain't had any company for twenty years, "'and don't intend to have any for another twenty or at any rate while I'm the head of the house. Don't blame her, Miranda, till you've heard her story, said Jane. It was in my mind right along, if we went to the meeting, some such thing might happen on account of Mr. Birch knowing father. The meeting was a small one, began Rebecca. I gave all your messages, and everybody was disappointed you couldn't come, for the president wasn't there, and Mrs. Matthews took the chair, which was a pity, for the seat wasn't nearly big enough for her. And she reminded me of a line in a hymn we sang, Wide as the heathen nations are. And she wore that kind of a beaver garden hat that always gets on one side. And Mr. Birch talked beautifully about the Syrian heathen, and the singing went real well. And there looked to be about forty cents in the basket that was passed on our side. And that wouldn't save even a heathen baby, would it? Then Mr. Birch said if any sister would offer entertainment, they would pass the night and have a parlor meeting in Riverboro tomorrow, with Mrs. Birch in Syrian costume, and lovely foreign things to show. Then he waited and waited, and nobody said a word. I was so mortified I didn't know what to do. And then he repeated what he said, and explained why he wanted to stay. And you could see he thought it was his duty. Just then Mrs. Robinson whispered to me and said the missionaries always used to go to the brick house when Grandfather was alive, and that he never would let them sleep anywhere else. I didn't know you had stopped having them because no traveling ministers have been here, except just for a Sunday morning, since I came to Riverboro, so I thought I ought to invite them, as you weren't there to do it for yourself, and you told me to represent the family. What did you do? Go up and introduce yourself as folks was going out? No, I stood right up in meeting. I had to, for Mr. Birch's feelings were getting hurt and nobody speaking. So I said, my aunts, Miss Miranda and Miss Jane Sawyer, would be happy to have you visit at the brick house, just as the missionaries always did when their father was alive, and they sent their respects by me. Then I sat down. "'and Mr. Birch prayed for Grandfather "'and called him a man of God "'and thanked our Heavenly Father "'that his spirit was still alive in his descendants. "'That was you. "'And that the good old house "'where so many of the brethren had been cheered and helped "'and from which so many had gone out "'strengthened for the fight "'was still hospitably open "'for the stranger and wayfarer. Sometimes, when the heavenly bodies are in just the right conjunction, nature seems to be the most perfect art. The word or the deed coming straight from the heart, without any thought of the effect, seems inspired. A certain gateway in Miranda Sawyer's soul had been closed for years. Not all at once had it been done, but gradually, and without her full knowledge. If Rebecca had plotted for days, and with the utmost cunning, she could not have effected an entrance into that forbidden country, and now, unknown to both of them, the gate swung on its stiff and rusty hinges, 
and the favoring wind of opportunity opened it wider and wider as time went on. All things had worked together amazingly for good. The memory of old days had been evoked, and the daily life of a pious and venerated father called to mind. The Sawyer name had been publicly dignified and praised. Rebecca had comported herself as the granddaughter of Deacon Israel Sawyer should, and showed conclusively that she was not all Randall as had been supposed. Miranda was rather mollified by and pleased with the turn of events, although she did not intend to show it, or give anybody any reason to expect that this expression of hospitality was to serve for a precedent on any subsequent occasion. "'Well, I see you did only what you was obliged to do, Rebecca,' she said, "'and you worded your invitation as nice as anybody could have done.' I wish your Aunt Jane and me wasn't both so worthless with these colds, but it only shows the good of having a clean house with every room in order, whether open or shut, and enough victuals cooked so t you can't be surprised and belittled by anybody, whatever happens. There was half a dozen there that might have entertained the birches as easy as not, if they hadn't a been too mean or lazy. Why didn't your missionaries come right along with you? They had to go to the station for their valise and their children. Are there children? groaned Miranda. Yes, Aunt Miranda, all born under Syrian skies. Syrian grandmother, ejaculated Miranda, and it was not a fact. How many? I didn't think to ask, but I will get two rooms ready, and if there are any over, I'll take them into my bed, said Rebecca, secretly hoping that this would be the case. "'Now, as you're both half sick, couldn't you trust me just once to get ready for the company? "'You can come up when I call. Will you?' "'I believe I will,' <sighs> sighed Miranda reluctantly. "'I'll lay down side of Jane in our bedroom and see if I can get strength to cook supper. "'It's half past three. Don't you let me lay a minute past five. "'I kept a good fire in the kitchen stove. I don't know, I'm sure.' why I should have baked a pot of beans in the middle of the week, but they'll come in handy. Father used to say there was nothing that went right to the spot with return missionaries like pork and beans and brown bread. Fix up the two south chambers, Rebecca. Rebecca, given a free hand for the only time in her life, dashed upstairs like a whirlwind. Every room in the brick house was as neat as wax, and she had only to pull up the shades go over the floors with a whisk broom, and dust the furniture. The ants could hear her scurrying to and fro, beating up pillows and feather beds, flapping towels, jingling crockery, singing, meanwhile, in her clear voice. In vain with lavish kindness the gifts of God are strown, the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. She had grown to be a handy little creature, and tasks she was capable of doing it all, she did like a flash, so that when she called her aunts at five o'clock to pass judgment, she had accomplished wonders. There were fresh towels on bureaus and washstands, the beds were fair and smooth, the pitchers were filled, and soap and matches were laid out. Newspaper, kindling, and wood were in the boxes, and a large stick burned slowly in each airtight stove. I thought I'd better just take the chill off, she explained, as they're right from Syria. And that reminds me, I must look it up in the geography before they get here. There was nothing to disapprove, so the two sisters went downstairs to make some slight changes in their dress. As they passed the parlor door, Miranda thought she heard a crackle and looked in. The shades were up. There was a cheerful blaze in the open stove in the front parlor, and a fire laid on the hearth in the back room. Rebecca's own lamp, her second Christmas present for Mr. Aladdin, stood on a marble-top table in the corner, the light that came softly through the, its iris-colored shade, transforming the stiff and gloomy ugliness of the room into a place where one could sit and love one's neighbor. "'For Massey's sake, Rebecca,' called Miss Miranda up the stairs, "'did you think we'd better open the parlor?' "'Rebecca came out on the landing, braiding her hair. "'We did on Thanksgiving and Christmas, "'and I thought this was about as great an occasion,' she said. 
I moved the wax flowers off the mantelpiece so they wouldn't melt, and put the shells, the coral, and the green stuffed bird on top of the wet knot so the children wouldn't ask to play with them. Brother Milliken's coming over to see Mrs. de Birch about business, and I shouldn't wonder if Brother and Sister Cobb happened in. Don't go down cellar. I'll be there in a minute to do the running. Miranda and Jane exchanged glances. "'Ain't she the beatenest creature that ever was born into the world?' exclaimed Miranda. "'But she can turn off work when she's got a mind to.' At quarter past five everything was ready, and the neighbors, those at least who were within sight of the brick house, a prominent object in the landscape when there was no leaves on the trees, were curious almost to desperation. "'Shades up in both parlors? Shades up in the two south bedrooms?' and fires, if human vision was to be relied upon, fires in about every room. If it had not been for the kind offices of a lady who had been at the meeting and who charitably called in at one or two houses and explained the reason for, of all this preparation, there would have been no sleep in many families. The missionary party arrived promptly, and there were but two children, seven or eight having been left with the brethren in Portland, to diminish traveling expenses. Jane escorted them all upstairs, while Miranda watched the cooking of the supper. But Rebecca promptly took the two little girls away from their mother, divested them of their wraps, smoothed their hair, and brought them down to the kitchen to smell the beans. There was a bountiful supper, and the presence of the young people robbed it of all possible stiffness. Aunt Jane helps clear the table and put away the food, while Miranda entertained in the parlor. But Rebecca and the infant birches washed the dishes and held high carnival in the kitchen, doing only trifling damage, breaking a cup and plate that had been cracked before, emptying a silver spoon with some dishwater out of the back door, an act never permitted at the brick house, and putting coffee grounds in the sink all evidences of crime having been removed by Rebecca, and damages repaired in all possible cases. The three entered the parlor, where Mr. and Mrs. Cobb and Deacon and Mrs. Milliken had already appeared. It was such a pleasant evening. Occasionally they left the heathen in his blindness bowing down to wooden stone, not for long, but just to give themselves and him time enough to breathe. And then the birches told strange, beautiful, marvelous things. The two smaller children sang together, and Rebecca, at the urgent request of Mrs. Birch, seated herself at the tinkling old piano and gave wild roved an Indian girl bright aliferata with considerable spirit and style. At eight o'clock she crossed the room, handed a palm leaf fan to her Aunt Miranda ostensibly that she might shade her eyes from the lamplight, but it was a piece of strategy that gave her an opportunity to whisper, "'How about cookies?' "'Do you think it's worth while?' sibilated Miss Miranda in answer. "'The Perkinsons always do.' "'All right. You know where they be.' Rebecca moved quietly towards the door, and the young birches cataracted after her as if they could not bear a second separation." In five minutes they returned, the little ones bearing plates of thin caraway wafers, hearts, diamonds, and circles, daintily sugared and flecked with caraway seed, raised in the garden behind the house. These were a speciality of Miss Jane's, and Rebecca carried a tray with six tiny crystal glasses filled with dandelion wine, for which Miss Miranda had been famous in years gone by. Old Deacon Israel had always had it passed, and he had bought the glasses himself in Boston. Miranda admired them greatly, not only for their beauty, but because they held so little. Before their advent, the dandelion wine had been served in sherry glasses. As soon as these refreshments, commonly called a collation in Riverboro, had been genteelly partaken of, Rebecca looked at the clock, rose from her chair in the children's corner, and said cheerfully, "'Come, time for little missionaries to be in bed.' Everybody laughed at this, the big missionaries most of all. 
as the young people shook hands and disappeared with Rebecca. End of chapter 19